Thank you for that faithful reading of God's Word. Parables are interesting, aren't they? Hey? They're, they're a direct link, the most direct link that we have between us and Jesus and what Jesus is teaching. But the problem is that sometimes these parables become so familiar to us that we miss the point of the parable. We've got to a stage where we're so familiar with the Bible and we read it and we read it and we read it, but we've got to say, well, sometimes are we really understanding what's being written? For a lot of people, it's a story about the Good Samaritan. And it's a story about being loving to people and showing that love. But that's not the point that Jesus is making here, is it? I hope that after this message that you'll be able to see what's happening here. So I just want to get straight into the text because that's where we're going to be. That's where we're going to hear from Jesus. That's where we can get our understanding from. So, verse 25, Jesus is teaching. The disciples have returned from their journey. And the lawyer says to him, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit life, eternal life? Now, he sort of knew already because... He was Jewish and he was a teacher. But Jesus doesn't answer him with an answer. He answers him with a question. Sometimes it's interesting when people do that. Jesus says, well, you know, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer says, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbour as your strength. Jesus says, well, you know, that's a good answer. If you do that, you'll have eternal life. Are they new commandments? Where did he get this from? Well, if you know a bit about Jewish history, about the Jewish forms of worship. You will find these verses in Deuteronomy, verses 6, 4 and 5, and in Leviticus, verse 19, chapter 19, verse 18. And Jesus also teaches this earlier in Luke and in Matthew. So Jesus said, that's the correct answer. Do that and you will live. Well, the lawyer says, oh, this is all right. I'm doing that. I love God with all my heart, soul, mind and strength. So I do that. It's interesting that he doesn't ask who is God and how he loved God. But it's all revealed in verse 29 the motive behind the question. See, this guy's a lawyer. And I've got nothing against lawyers because law is determined by definitions. And I'm sure that if you ask Ben here, that he would say that definitions are the most important things in the law because you can talk about something, but if you've got the wrong definition, you're not talking about the same thing. So the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, says to Jesus, who is my neighbour? And you think, well, that's a pretty innocuous sort of question, you know, who's my neighbour? But see, the problem is the definition of neighbour. To the Jewish mind, who was the 
who was the neighbour. Now he may think, well, who's my neighbour? He says, that his neighbour is the person that he thinks his neighbour is. So to him, the neighbour may be, oh, it's a, it's a godly person. My neighbour is someone who has the same views that I have. My neighbour is a person who doesn't sin against God. My neighbour is a person who isn't an enemy of God. And they considered that anybody who was a sinner to be an enemy of God. And they justified this because they would read Psalm 139 where he says, Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a complete hatred. I count them my enemies. So if the lawyer didn't think that a person was righteous in the eyes of God, that person was then considered to be not my neighbour, but rather my enemy. You can see where he's coming from here. See, he's self-righteous. I love my neighbour. I love those who keep your commandments. I love the priests, I love the Pharisees, or some of the scribes I might love. So his definition of neighbour is rather limited. And Jesus in his grace doesn't challenge him on this, but rather he launches into this parable which we have come to know as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, just a word of warning before we start down this path. The people in this story didn't actually exist. It's a parable. It's a story. It's an illustration that Jesus is using to make a point. So we can't talk about what were the motives of the priest, what were the motives of the Levi. They didn't have motives. They didn't exist they're an illustration that Jesus is using to make a point. So Jesus tells this parable, and I'm sure we all know it, don't we? The priest comes down, and the lawyer smiles because the priest is the honourable one. He's the person who represents God. He's the person who presents the sacrifices to God, who represents the people to God and then who represents God to the people. That's the role of the priest. He's that intermediary. So he's travelling down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he's, he's coming after the first man, the man who's the victim... Now we read, the man was going down, he fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him till he was half dead, it says. But actually he was so close to death that you would have to go up and take his pulse and and see physically that he was breathing and living. He was that close to death. So why... Why was the man stripped? Why did the robbers take his clothes? I mean, they took his money, they almost took his life, and they took his clothes. So why did they take his clothes? Well, let's be honest. If you see someone lying on the side of the road and they've got a $2,000 suit on, you're going to run over and help them. Oh, poor fellow because you'll be looking for some recompense or some reward or something. But if he's lying there and you can't see if he's rich or poor, you can't see whether he's a king or a pauper, then there's no motivation there, there's no financial motivation, is there, 
to help that person. So by chance, the priest is coming down. As I said, the lawyer will be going, oh, priest, oh, that's good. He's going to help him. But he doesn't do anything. He just walks past the person lying in the gutter. Doesn't display any love. In fact, displays a total indifference to the man's state. Here's a man who you would have expected to show God's love. But he doesn't do that. He shows total indifference. And the same thing happens with the next person who comes down, the Levite. Here's a man who works at the temple, who deals with the things of God, who helps lead the worship, who helps lead the daily recital of what they call the Shema, which is from the Deuteronomy, you know. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, the Lord is God, and you shall love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That was repeated twice a day. Did he do that? Did he show that love? It's, it's like he doesn't see the existence of this person here. He's lying there, exposed to the element, close to death, and just completely abandoned. So there seems to be no hope for this person, no help. Things become interesting. Verse 33. But a Samaritan. (gasps) A what? You could almost hear the shock, the intake of breath of the surrounding crowd. Who were Jewish people? A Samaritan. What's a Samaritan doing here? What do you mean, a Samaritan? A Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. A lot of us don't understand the significance of that. A Samaritan. We just think, oh yeah, it's a Samaritan. Someone who lived in the region of Samaria. No big problem. But yet, if you look into the history of the Jewish people and the Samaritans, you see a deep hatred between these two people. The Samaritans were the half-breed hated ones. If the Gentiles were called dogs, then the Samaritans were the Mongol dogs. They were hated They were despised. They were seen as evil because they were a mixture of Jewish people and Gentiles. Now, the hatred went both ways. The Samaritans hated the Jews just as much because they were rejected by the Jews. They were so evil in the sight of the Jews that they wouldn't let them worship at the temple. And so the Samaritans built their own temple. And we see this in John where Jesus has that discussion with the woman at the well. Can you remember that? You know, Jesus says to her, you know, I've come to get water. And she says, what are you doing talking to me? You have no dealings. You have no dealings with the Samaritans. 
we worship here and you worship in Jerusalem. So they had their own temple. They were that hated. So they were despised. They were outcast. They had no access to the Jewish temple. No access to worship. No access to sacrifice. No access to God as far as the Jewish people were concerned. And yet, despite all that, this Samaritan, the outcast, has compassion on this victim. Let's see what extent he has, the extent of that compassion. The first thing is he went over to him. He was interested. He wanted to see, oh, is this, what's happening? Is this fellow okay? Is he alive? Is he dead? So at least he was interested. He bound up his wounds. So how did he bind up his wounds? Well, with a bandage. Where did he get the bandage from? He didn't dash off to the 7-Eleven and get it. He didn't go to Kmart. It was stuff that he was carrying for himself. It was out of his own provisions that he cared for this nameless victim. To travel in those times was pretty tough. You had to take everything with you. So you had to take a supply of bandages, a supply of wine, not to drink, but for sterilisation of wounds. He took oil usually, which is very useful. So this is what the man does. He binds up the man's wounds. He puts oil and wine on the man's wounds. The oil is to used to rub the wounds, to soothe it. The wine is used to sterilise the wounds. So he's taking care of him, medical care. Then he picks up the fellow and he puts him on his own animal. We don't know what it was. It could have been a donkey, a horse, a camel. We don't know. It just says beast. So he's been travelling down the road on a beast and he gets off and he goes over and helps him and then he puts the stranger onto his animal so that then he has to walk leading the animal. That's a significant sacrifice, I'd say. Then he goes to the inn. When he gets there, he books accommodation. And he stays at the inn and he takes care of him all that night, looking after him, tending to his needs, giving him food to eat perhaps and a drink. And then the next day, he goes up to the innkeeper and he gives him two silver coins. That's what two denarii are, two silver coins. And he says, take care of him, whatever you spend, when I come back, I'll be right. And we think, oh, well, that's all right, man. Now, some translations say two denarii, some translations say two pennies. We, we have no real sense of what the value of those denarii are from that text. Now we know from earlier when Jesus is talking that a denarii is a day's wage. So it's like, okay, so what's the average salary for today? $1,000 a week for most people? That would be an average salary. So, what, $200 a day? So it's $400. That's a sizable gift, isn't it? To pay to the innkeeper to say, look after this man. But then what's the cost of accommodation? Well, if we say $40 a night. So you can see that He's paid for the man's accommodation for the next one or two months, perhaps. Are you beginning to see 
the amount of giving that this Samaritan has in him. Not only has he paid for the accommodation for this person for two months, but he's saying, when I come back, if you've spent any more money to help this man recover, because remember, he's been beaten nearly to death. So he's not going to get over that in a couple of days, is he? You know, it's not like they're going to rush him off to ER and they're going to jump on him and do all that. No, he's got to recover and it's going to take time and it's going to take care. So whatever else, whatever the expenses are, I'm going to cover it. It's pretty extravagant, isn't it? Hey? A total stranger from a Samaritan, this person's enemy. And he's doing that. It's just amazing. Jesus gets to the end of the story and he turns to the lawyer and he says, so which one of these three proved to be a neighbour to the man who fell among the robbers. Can you see how the question has been changed? The first question is, who is my neighbour? Jesus asks the question, which one acted like a neighbour? Who was the one who became the neighbour? Who behaved like the neighbour? The lawyer says, oh, well, it was, it was like, um, yeah, it was the one who showed him mercy. He couldn't even say the Samaritan because he wouldn't bring himself to say that name. He couldn't. He might have thought it, but he couldn't. It's like he's stuck in his throat. The Samaritan. The Samaritan. Couldn't say it. It's it's the one who showed him mercy. Go and do likewise. If you want to inherit life, go and do likewise. Is that a direction for us that we should do that? Not really. See, Jesus is talking to a person here who is so, and I use the term advisedly, so full of themselves, so full of their own self righteousness. Yes, I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and I love my neighbour as myself. But I define who my neighbour is. And Jesus is saying, well, actually, no. You do not love God with everything you have because that isn't possible. You do not love your neighbour as yourself because you, you wouldn't even do that to someone who you'd classify as a neighbour. I mean, you might do that for your wife. You might do that for your mother-in-law. You might do that for a brother or a sister or a child. But you wouldn't do that for a stranger. And you wouldn't do that for a stranger who was actually against God or against your belief in God, you, you just walk straight past like those other two did. So the story is not about being good to people. The story is about becoming aware of how sinful we are, how high God's standard is, the perfection that God demands. We read the words and we think, yes, I can do that. I can love my neighbour as myself. 
read the Good Samaritan, put it in context. No, I can't. It's impossible for me to do that. It, it's, it's so costly. It's time consuming. And, and the Samaritan had compassion on the man. And it wasn't, oh yeah, I care about him. He displayed real love. Jesus was saying, not who is your neighbour, but who qualifies to be loved. Sometimes we become so insular that we're not really interested in the people around us. God expects us to be interested in the people around us, to show genuine love. So righteousness is the issue that's being revealed to him. He is Jesus, God incarnate, the only truly righteous person in all of history. And he's ready to show that to the lawyer. The lawyer just has to say, I see the point, I can't do that. I don't love my neighbour as myself. And actually, I don't really love God as much as I should. That should have been the reaction. As, Christian, as a Christian, that's my reaction. I know I don't love God as I should. I know that I don't love my neighbour as I should. We're not told in the text what the lawyer's reaction was to that. Hopefully... He came to his senses, but we don't know. The, the question is, what's my reaction to the message? Because as much as it is a message for the lawyer, it's a message for me. As much as it showed the lawyer's shortcomings, it shows my shortcomings. So it's the same message. It's not about being good. It's about the realisation that no matter what I do, I'm never good enough. So we need to come to Jesus for his mercy and for his grace. And when we're saved, it's amazing how our attitudes can change, isn't it? We begin to see people in a different light. We look at people and we say, well, yeah, sure, they do wrong things and, and, and they're not godly and, and they do all sorts of things. But you know what? There but for the grace of God, that's me. But for the grace of God, that's me. See, our love for God increases. It's not that we have to love God. Nobody can force you to make, nobody can force or make you love them. The desire to love God comes from inside, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit indwells you and it leads you into that relationship where you want to love God. You can't do it perfectly. But the desire increases that you want to love God more every day. The same as you want to love people more every day. You can't love people perfectly. But the desire, you want to, you want to share the love of God and you do that by loving people. So this isn't a story to make people feel guilty about not giving to charities. Is it? It's not a story to make you feel guilty about that. Rather, it's designed to make us feel guilty that we don't love God perfectly and that we don't love other people perfectly. And we know that we can never do that. I just want to take a challenge here. I'm going to read from 
1 Corinthians 13. And everybody says, oh yes, I know that chapter. Okay. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Okay, all you husbands, when you get home, I want you to read this in front of your wives. All you wives, when you get home, I want you to read this in front of your children. Okay? Where it says love, where it says love, I want to put in your name. Here we go. Stephen is patient and kind and does not envy or boast. Stephen is not arrogant or rude. Stephen does not insist on his own way. Stephen is not irritable or resentful. Oh dear. Oops. I've got no hope, have I? Hmm? I'm not perfect, I know that. I think we need reminders like that. Just to remind us that, well, we are human and that we do fail. So as we conclude, I want us to remember that the story of the Good Samaritan is not really about the Samaritan. It's about the lawyer. The challenge to the lawyer and the hope that he changed. Let's pray.